afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the panel was a little worried by the competition in the other room, talking about North Korea. We were wondering how many people would come to our panel. We were pleased to see so many people still came to us um, and made such an impressive messages like Mark Littlewood saying, I expect the best from this panel. So we were all scared, but I hope we were doing well this afternoon. The panel is called Learn from the Best ALA Mentors. What that means is Atlas, for those of you who are not aware of it, Atlas has started a new program at the beginning of this year, which is a mentorship program where 15 mentors were selected to work with either one or two think tanks. Um, all five of us were mentors, so 10 others were are around, maybe also in this room. Are there more mentors? Linda is a mentor. So. Bridget also, okay, great. Were any of the uh, any of the institutes here that had been mentored at that time, the mentees? By Charlie, great. So we also get your perspective in the discussion, that is fantastic. And you too, okay, great, fantastic. So we have both sides in this room, which would be very helpful. Um, we try to meet each other about every month or every other month, that was the very um, in the cooperation. And we had a chance to meet once in the last six months in whatever, using whatever opportunity. And this is the second time we come together with our mentees here and also finalize it for this period. And now the idea is to probably extend the program and go into continued cooperation, but all that is yet to be finalized. So this is sharing experiences. Of course, on the panel, I guess we all agree, we wouldn't go into the details of what we did with the think tanks that we worked with, but we have some messages that we could extract from that and, of course, from our other experiences because all of us who are in this program have been working in the think tank scene for a while. What that means when we look at the panelists is our first speaker will be Larry Reed. Larry really doesn't need an introduction in this uh, crowd here. He has been uh, for 21 years the president of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. We got to know each other at that time. You wrote the seven principles of sound public policy. We translated it into Chinese and a whole lot of Asian languages at that time. We got to know each other then. By now, of course, he is the president of the Foundation for Economic Education. The second speaker will be Dr. Rohan Jose Dabu. He is the founding CEO of the Global Adaptation Institute and was the managing director of the World Bank, held government positions in El Salvador for 12 years. So also somebody who's been around public policy for a long time, held important positions. Glenn Bollick, um, with the Gold uh, with the Goldwater Institute, is the vice president for litigation. He has been a co-founder of the Institute for Justice and served as president of the Alliance for School Choice and, like with everybody else, many other positions as well. And last but not least, and Fitzgerald, who we all know to be such an expert on fundraising. She's been in our think tank MBA that I have been running in school of um, The fundraising expert ever since. She has been a trainer and, and is a great help to everybody who seeks new ways of raising funds for the Institute. She is president of the AC Fitzgerald and Associates Company she has been with the Heritage Foundation Director of Development uh, for a long time, so also here many years of experience on this panel. So I asked the panelists to speak for about five to ten minutes maximum, and after that we have lots of time for question and answers. Larry, you start. Thank you, Rainer. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. My mentee in the Atlas uh, Mentorship Program over the last uh, eight or nine months was um, Brad DeVos of the Bastiat Society. I know he's at another session today, but I do hope uh, all of you can take a look at the Bastiat Society website, learn more about them. Uh, I think we touched on in our mentorship arrangement just about every aspect of think tank uh, management, marketing, communications, fundraising, and uh, I think it was a, a wonderful experience. I believe Brad does as well. In the few minutes I have, I am just going to toss out a few tips about uh, think tank management. Uh, this first story I want to share with you is one that many of you perhaps have heard, I don't know, but it's about a, uh, 
a man who was walking down the block uh, where there's a construction project, and he noticed there was three people uh, a few yards apart, uh, each one laying bricks. And he approaches the first man and he says, uh, what are you doing? And the man says, I'm laying bricks. He walks a little further to the next man who's doing precisely the same thing, and he says, what are you doing? And the second man says, I'm building a wall. And he goes a little further to the third guy, again doing precisely the same thing. He says, what are you doing? And this man says, I'm constructing a cathedral. Now, what kind of a staff would you most want to have at your think tank? A staff of people who would give you the answer that the first man did, or the answer that the third one gave? All doing the same thing in this case. But it's clear, isn't it, that the third man had the vision. The third man was doing much, something much more important, uh, much less mundane than just laying bricks. He understood the organization's mission, the objectives, uh, had some uh, uh, passion for it. Uh, at FEE, that's something that we have worked on in recent years, and I think we've succeeded uh, fantastically in reorienting the staff, refreshing the staff, bringing on new people. If you ask anybody at FEE today, what are you doing? They would not give you answers like, well, I'm stuffing envelopes, or I'm going to a meeting. Uh, they would say things like, I hope anyway, they would say things like, we are reaching newcomers to ideas of liberty in the 16 to 24 year old demographic. We're introducing them to those ideas, bringing them to that aha moment where they realize that uh, what they've been taught before it was seriously an error, and they see the world now in a new and different way. And they're going to commit themselves uh, in whatever professions they choose to advancing liberty in one fashion or another. I think that's the kind of answer you would get from most of us, from all of us at FEE, because everybody's on the same page. They understand the vision, and we look for every opportunity uh, to reinforce that. Everyone realizes that they are an important, in fact, indispensable component in the machine that is fee that has an objective that all of us understand and share. A second tip I want to share with you is to hire for character. Hire for character. I've often said if I had to fill a position and there were two people in the final round, uh, one of them was absolutely uh, you know, the best at uh, uh, the particular task that this job sought to fulfill but was a person of questionable character for a number of reasons. And the other person didn't know much about the work, but was of solid, sterling character. I'd be inclined to hire the second. Because if a person has character, chances are, almost by definition, he or she is teachable. And ultimately, what you want is not a genius with no character. You want uh, somebody with character who can develop into a genius, into a highly qualified person uh, to fill a job uh, you have in mind. But you want them to be of strong character, somebody that is uh, reliable, honest, uh, intellectually humble, always eager to learn, uh, somebody you can, whose word you can trust uh, from the word go. Character is, I think, everything uh, when it comes to staffing. Another point is uh, to think big. Uh, I recall the early days at the Mackinac Center when I was guilty of not doing this, of thinking small, of being uh, going to a meeting with a potential donor, making a case, and going away, having asked for maybe 5000 and getting it, and feeling like, wow, it was, you know, to, to walk away with a $5,000 check. But then later I realized, but he probably would have written a $50,000 check if I had made uh, a stronger case, if I had uh, made the case that what we're doing is not just interesting, but vitally important to the future uh, of his kids and their kids. Uh, so think big at all that you do. Uh, don't have time to tell you the story about how we first got our, our first $1 million donation at uh, Mac Mackinac. But it exceeded all previous donations by at least $900,000. <laughs> and uh, we got it because we thought big. If we made a case uh, that was compelling, uh, that uh, we weren't just a seven-person outfit. We were a juggernaut uh, uh, on a mission to change the state of Michigan. And finally, another point that rarely comes up at conferences like this, and I think our movement really needs a lot of work on this and concentration, and that is uh, succession planning. Uh, I'm 
I'm very proud of the fact that we engineered at Mackinac over a five-year period a, a transition that was as picture perfect as it can get. Uh, the organization didn't skip a beat after that five years when I handed off uh, my presidency to my successor. And that was not by accident. It was through planning. And as our movement matures, and many of us who were around in the early days when there were a few think tanks, and maybe we were the founder or one of the founders, uh, and now we're getting up into our 60s or 70s, uh, we need to consciously think about succession planning. And I can't tell you how many times I have observed in other organizations, and for a time even years ago in, in the one I run now, that the failure to plan properly for succession uh, is an open door to uh, chaos and all kinds of uh, potential dangers. So it's not too late, no matter how old you may be or how long you've been at the helm, uh, to be thinking of what comes after you. And uh, if nothing else, one of the earlier tips I shared with you uh, relates to this perfectly. If you hired for character, if you got a deep bench of people who, with solid character and some experience, you probably have done a lot already towards a successful succession plan. But uh, how many have noticed groups that have given that very little thought, if at all? And yet you know within five years that group is likely to have substantial changes. Uh, so plan for it. And uh, if you do, then you have a much greater chance of that being a uh, successful transition. Thank you very much. Larry has touched upon a few or several points that uh, will be common to the table. So I'll try to uh, come from a slightly different angle in terms of uh, not only the work that I was very happy to do together with Armando and Claudia from the IPEA uh, think tank from Mexico, but uh, rather from the perspective of uh, think tanks in countries where, uh, for example, the generosity that exists primarily in the United States from the fundraising perspective is not present. So it is not the same, I think, to um, have uh, not only uh, a great vision, but have the resources to take that vision into some practical uh, and useful uh, thoughts and actions in your country. Uh, in, I would argue, in the United States, as for example, in Mexico or my own country, El Salvador. So we have to be, uh, a little bit more creative, and therefore, I have uh, my five to seven minutes. I'm going to try to talk for a couple of minutes about the experience in my country uh, when I was in government for uh, 12 years without belonging to any political party then or now. And briefly, about uh, lessons learned from that experience and how some of those lessons uh, I was able to put them into practice in a few organizations that I have either started or uh, have been part of. So El Salvador is a country that went from hardship to investment rate in six years. 5% of the population was killed. 22% of the population migrated primarily to the United States. At the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, the reputation of the country was not zero. Nobody would come to invest in the country. <clears throat> Many of us were just complaining about the situation until we were recruited to actually join. And we had, which was the first lesson, uh, good mentors. In our case, we had uh, a large number of uh, members of the Chicago Boys from Chile helping us out in doing the reforms that my countries needed. And that's one of the first lessons I learned that for, for, for organizations like IPEA or others, uh, it is important to have uh, a good critical mass of people who have hands-on experience. We implemented the reforms that uh, are very well known by you from opening the economy to strengthening institutions to um, privatizing all the state-owned assets. Uh, and in the way, we put a few uh, um, bulletproof mechanisms to avoid uh, the uh, 
future leaders to undo some of this reform. We were not too successful in doing that, as I will tell you in a minute. But by 19, in 1992, we signed the peace agreements, and by 1998, El Salvador was investment grade. So economic freedom works. At that time, only Chile was investment grade in Latin America. El Salvador was the second one. Well, in the year 2000, and in the year 2001, as published by the Wall Street Journal, according to the Index of Economic Freedom, we beat those two years. Chile, we were in the position number 13 in the world, twice, and uh, that's a sign that uh, some results were actually achieved. So the third lesson is that it is important to use the proper matrix, compare yourself to others that have done better than you, and try to do your best to get as close as possible to, to that. Regrettably, uh, populism took over in the recent past, and today El Salvador has lost 40 positions uh, from most of the indicators that one could use. So the fourth lesson I learned in government was that you have to bulletproof as much as possible the reforms that you do. And there are two of those reforms that I'm very proud to have been part of. One is the privatization of all of the state-owned assets, especially telecommunications, which has not been undone. I will tell you why. And the second one was the globalization of the economy. We eliminated our currency and put the dollar as the legal tender to avoid the politicians from fooling around, just like here in the United States, printing money whenever they want. So uh, those two reforms have not been undone, in spite of the fact that we have very leftist governments, the last one and the current one. Why? Telecom, because we privatize in competition. And in a country the size of, size of Rhode Island, 5, 21,000 square kilometers, 6 million people, we have five telephone companies. So people enjoy the benefits of an open economy and of competition. And therefore, nobody will dare, I would argue, to go back to where we were. In the case of dollarization, even though we were investment grade, interest rates were about 27%. There was still a risk involved in the country. So by dollarizing, interest rates came down to 6.5%. So dollarization is not going to be undone, at least in my view, and it hasn't been undone in Korea, in Ecuador, where Korea is in power, because interest rates will go back up, because inflation will go back up, and inflation is the work tax you can impose on people. Now, quickly, because I'm about to get the two minutes yes. notice, uh, I've been involved with, uh, with, with several uh, uh, think tanks, uh, including the last one, uh, which uh, we created in 2010, to talk about climate change, not the Al Gore approach to climate change, but the adaptation side of climate change. We raised $10 million in six months to work on that topic and have developed a matrix that uses the index of economic freedom as a way of measuring how each country is doing in terms of its capacity to adapt to changes in the climate, which have, have existed throughout history. Four think tanks, therefore, have mentioned four lessons. But the last one uh, that I'd like to share with you is that I think that the greatest challenge that new think tanks face is on the fundraising and on the credibility front. And that's ultimately the market test we face in our organizations. To be able to convince and persuade people to support a particular endeavor and to actually deliver something that creates enough credibility. And I have seen many presentations yesterday and today of people that are doing that. The opportunity in order to manage a little bit of those two challenges, I think, lies on having a creative product that can be easily translated into actions by those that are in a decision-making position. And second, and this is uh, an idea that I want to put on the table, and I have been bouncing this back with Alex Schaffer for quite some time, is the need of creating what I call a political SWAT team, where whenever there is a 
leader in a country that's attempting to do certain reforms, that we can support that person or that government, just like we have Chileans helping us out some years ago. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am so thrilled that Atlas put together this mentoring program. I was lucky enough to have as my mentee Richard Lawrence of the Foundation for Economic Education. And I'm not sure I imparted a single thing of value to Richard, but I do know that Goldwater is now using fee materials in its uh, intern program. <laughs> you can never tell how these things are going to work out, but uh, just putting organizations together uh, in a systematic way, I think, is incredible. Uh, I know most of you are probably expecting me to talk about um, suing bureaucrats, which, of course, is my favorite thing on earth. Um, but instead, I thought that given uh, what brought us here for this session, I would talk about the importance of mentoring in public policy organizations. It's something that we all ought to probably be doing more systematically. Academics often do it uh, as a matter of course, but we don't uh, all do it as, as much as we probably should. We all have internship and training programs, but when I'm talking about mentoring, I'm talking about literally taking someone under your wing, uh, nurturing that person, turning that person into a mini-me, and then giving them wings and watching them take flight. It's a lot, it can be a lot of time, and it can take a lot of patience and effort, uh, but it is, from a cost-benefit perspective, one of the most important things that we can do. When I think about the young people I've mentored over the years, many of them are superstars now in their own right. I'm so thrilled to see my old colleague, Marnie Sukhoff here today, who was a young lawyer with me at the Institute for Justice. She is now suing bureaucrats in Canada, which is an even more target-rich environment than the United States. So I'm just so proud of that. And when I look at these people, I, I really feel like I could retire today and uh, the progress uh, in litigation would still go on because of all of these people uh, that, uh, uh, that I've had the opportunity to work with and impart some, some knowledge and, and training. Um, I remember one, one uh, summer I uh, was talking to an intern at the Cato Institute and I asked that intern uh, how his experience was, and he said it was absolutely phenomenal. He said, uh, the only thing that I regret was that I didn't get to meet Ed Crane over the course of the summer. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, that's awful. Um, and I, I love Ed, and I wouldn't use him as an example if I, I didn't uh, respect him so much, but just by appearing at a lunch talk, he would have made for that kid, and probably for the other 50 or so interns, whatever Cato has, just an incredible impact. And that moment made me realize how, how vitally important it is for each and every one of us to take the time to impact the young minds and lives that we have an opportunity to do. I know I would not be here today if it weren't for the incredible mentors that I had. My friend Chip Meller, who was my first boss out of, out of law school, and he and I went on to form the, the Institute for Justice together. Clarence Thomas, boy, was I lucky to have that one. <coughs> well, my favorite stories involve one of my heroes, and I suspect is, he is uh, quite a shared hero in this room, Milton Friedman. And for those of you who are, like me, lucky enough to get to know him, I am sure you know one very important thing about him, and that is that no one who ever wrote him a letter did not have that letter responded to. I often think to myself, if Milton Friedman wasn't too busy to write people back who, who write you a letter, then for God's sakes, I'm not too busy. Um, and I, I've talked to so many people over the years who said, you know what, one time I wrote Milton Friedman a letter, and you'll never believe this, but, and I can finish their sentence, he wrote you back. This makes a lifetime impact for for me, I'll never forget the experience with Mill Knight. I sent him a, a manuscript, or I asked him if he would put, do a blurb for my book. 
uh, voucher wars. And he wrote back and he said, I'd be happy to do it, but I have a policy of never blurbing a book that I haven't read cover to cover. So I sent him a copy of the manuscript. A couple of weeks later, it comes back and, uh, and Milton writes this wonderful letter. He said, as promised, here is a blurb for your book. Uh, however, I have also taken the liberty of editing the entire book. <laughs> <laughs> How much better that book would have sold if it said, as edited by Milton. <laughs> but I mean, this guy was incredible. And the influence he had was not just his own mind, but the people that he affected and impacted and trained across the way, along the way. Um, my rules of thumb for, for internships uh, or for mentoring is first of all, to each and every one of us become deeply involved in our own internship program so that we do touch the lives of, of uh, the people uh, who intern for us. But deliberately choose proteges at all times. I always have at least one mentee that I'm actively um, uh, working with. Uh, people who are young and unshaped, uh, you begin by as teaching by osmosis. And uh, since I'm a, a lawyer, I always like to, to find a creditor to, to uh, analogize like the lions do. The lion takes out the little cub and teaches the cub how to hunt. And before you know it, they are hunting on their own. And that's exactly what we need to do. If you get involved in mentoring in a serious way, two things are guaranteed to happen. First of all, you'll begin to run into people that you mentored uh, years ago, and they are now like real adults and everything, and it will make you realize how old you are. <laughs> this is the downside. But the best part is what I call, and I apologize for my language, but there's only one way to say this, the holy shit moment. And that is where one of the people that you have mentored does something so stratospheric that it just fills you with awe and pride. I remember when the very first person I mentored, Scott Pollock, at the Institute for Justice, got up in the U.S. Supreme Court and argued the Kilo case. I'm actually choking up now all these years later. And I thought to myself, I could not do that. He took this area of the law, he pioneered it, and he is taking it to the U.S. Supreme Court. I can tell you, we don't think about this all that often. We don't think about it in a systematic way, but there is literally nothing you can do that will have a longer lasting impact than to train and nurture others to follow in your footsteps. Thank you so much. century Persian poet who said, be a lamp or a lifeboat or a ladder. And we all know in our lives that at different times we relied on other people to be that lamp to give us ideas or inspiration or that lifeboat when we were in trouble or that ladder when we needed that step up. So. I really encourage you to think about in your lives where you can be a lamp or a lifeboat or a ladder to others. And I think here at through the Atlas Network, I think we see that all the time. Uh, and that's why I, I'm so pleased to have the chance to be, work with Atlas, be part of Atlas, and uh, be part of this mentorship program. So what I'd like to cover are some things that uh, I think really exemplify very successful nonprofit organizations. And I'm taking this from a study that was done of hundreds of nonprofits around the world, and they came down with four things that really are the hallmarks of successful nonprofit organizations. And the first thing is to have a clearly articulated mission. That is really the focal point for the commitment of the board and staff, and something you can use to measure your progress by. The second thing is to have an individual who truly leads the organization. And that person really provides the inspiration for the staff to carry out the mission. The third thing is to have an informed and engaged board of directors that works closely with the CEO, but it's also, a, it, they act as a bridge to the larger community. 
And then finally, that you have a successful nonprofit has the ability to, on an on a ongoing basis, secure the financial and personnel resources it needs. But I want to add to that, because I thought that study was good and probably not a huge surprise to all of you who are around here that this makes a nonprofit successful. But we've had a chance to work with over 100 different nonprofits in my firm in the freedom movement. And in doing so, we, we came up and I think we've observed a lot of other characteristics that make nonprofits successful. And first is persistence. Never, never, never give up, as Winston Churchill said. And I think there are people around this room, if you are one of, part of one of those newer nonprofit organizations that are out here, I think you can look around and see the value of persistence from the organizations that maybe were in your boat a few years ago and have grown dramatically. The second thing is honesty. And I don't, certainly honesty in, in terms of the product you're creating and the integrity of the, of the work that you're doing, but also honesty among the leadership of your strengths and also the areas in which you need to improve. And then how do you best manage around that? The third thing is flexibility. And I think this ties back to our entrepreneurial spirit. Um, we have to be open to opportunities, but also be able to adapt based on the, the political and economic realities. <coughs> and that's true for our fundraising plan as well. We need to be able to adapt to our own country and our own culture. Humility. That's a tough one. But, you know, sometimes we need that outside perspective of someone giving us a reality check. And I think this, this, the, the mentees who are part of this program were very brave and humble to have us work with them and realize that you know, there are some, sometimes some good objective ideas. And then finally, an attitude of gratitude, okay? And um, we can't forget those who've gone before us and paved the way. And last night, we heard that wonderful tribute to John Blundell. This afternoon, that we remembered Leonard Vigio. And there are many people who helped us along the way that we can't forget about. And I want to share with you just a brief story um, in around 2001, when I was working at the Heritage Foundation, there was a, a philanthropist by the name of Catherine Davis, and she had decided to pledge a large gift to the Heritage Foundation after she died. So she was living, but that was her, her pledge. And um, I was working in the development department at the time and, and played a small role with that gift. I mean, really small, you know, tiny. All right, about five years later, I leave Heritage to start my own consulting firm to help free market groups in the movement. Um, and then, fast forward, 2013, I get a phone call from John Von Cannon. John Von Cannon, is, as many of you know, is a wonderful fundraiser and vice president of development at Heritage. And he was calling me, me with some sad news. Catherine Davis had died. But there was some good news, too, in the sense that the Heritage Foundation was about to receive a gift of $26 million. Huge gift, obviously. Now, John was not calling to boast about this record-breaking gift. He was calling me to thank me for that tiny role, which he made sound like was a much bigger role, but that tiny role I played on that with that gift over a dozen years ago for an organization I no longer work for. That, my friends, is gratitude. So I encourage you all to think about how we can be grateful to, to the people who helped us. It's all part of mentoring, but also how we can just remember all those who have helped pave the way. And with that, I want to express my gratitude to all of you and the leadership you're showing in the Freedom Movement. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the four panelists. Atlas asked me to also say a few words from my experience. I will keep it short because most things have already been said. But I had the pleasure to mentor the uh, Somebody Prosperity Foundation. Robin, the executive director, is here. And Tracy uh, Latik from the uh, Freedom Factory in South Korea, who is identifying North Korean refugees as stars and ambassadors of freedom. And we have them in the other, in the other room at the moment. So quite well there as well. 
But I have also worked in Atlas with the Think Tank MBA. We have had until now about 120, 130 think tanks coming to that MBA, and we had 150 leaders writing business plans. And I would like to refer more to that than to the tool that I mentioned. And here I want to add to what was said earlier that one has to see what one's strengths and one's shortcomings are when you try to start a think tank. Uh, sometimes we try to train everybody to be a good manager. But if somebody comes as a very good researcher, somebody has lots of great ideas, it's not necessarily that that person also is a good manager. So I think what, from my experience, it is important that those who try to start the think tank must be very clear what they are good at. And then they must see that they get others to come in and complement the skills that they don't have. So don't try, that's like when we see lots of government programs to create entrepreneurship and they're trying to get those that produce little apps to become the entrepreneur of the year. But a lot of people who are the computer nerds who are very good with creating apps are not necessarily good business people. So here it's better to match people rather than to turn them into the entrepreneurs. A lot of them have it in them, but sometimes we need to also acknowledge that uh, they might just be the ones giving ideas and not the entrepreneurs themselves. So that is, I think, a critical thought I would like to add. The second uh, thought I have is mentoring is a good thing, but working with so many who are upcoming leaders in the think tanks, sometimes they face a difficult situation in their own think tank. And since there's more than 100, I don't you know, so large enough crowd so that nobody feels personally touched by this. But there is sometimes the old board, the old ED, there is sometimes a situation where upcoming leaders in the think tank don't know how can I get through there. And here I'd like to add a concept that is relatively new in the scene, which is not mentoring, but upward mentoring. A lot of organizations now understand that only the young staff understand Facebook, Google+, Plus, how to use Facebook for business, etc. And sometimes it's good to use those to create your website and your outreach rather than let that be done by the very experienced but also a little bit older staff members on the team. So it's about opening up the organization so that those talents that you Clint's books are highly off, and it's absolutely right, they're supposed to replace the, 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 the last generation at one point. They need to find the avenue to that, and that's the succession planning that also Larry touched upon so clearly. So these two things I would like to add. To this. Now, um, plenty of time. Thanks everybody for being as short as uh, we wanted to be. So, plenty of time for questions and the answers. If you don't mind, you would stand behind the microphone for, for your questions. One announcement for while you think about your questions. One announcement is, and you have heard that in the other sessions, that this discussion here is also accredited by the uh, Atlas Leadership Academy. Uh, Cindy is there already getting the list where you can sign up. So if you have, you have attended three of these accredited sessions, you will get one point uh, and you're one point closer to being an ALA graduate. So uh, with this. Um, so I'm going to direct this to you, Anne. Um, you mentioned right off about um, the mission statement, having a really clear mission statement. And I, I think sometimes we get mission and vision mixed up. And I was just wondering, uh, if you have any suggestions about how, like I have a feeling that I have to really, really dial in the mission statement and be very, very specific about what we're doing in order to achieve the greater vision, which is currently our mission statement. Is that a good approach or is it kind of right the way it is? Well, I guess I, I always just look, the way I look at a vision statement is what does the world look like if we accomplished our mission? Vision, yes. The vision. So I think it's it, one of those things that has to be inspirational enough, but grounded in reality. Right. Um, but, but your mission statement right now, you said it's, what's the challenge? The mission statement to me sounds more like our vision. Okay. And I think the mission statement needs to be really like feet on the ground, kind of really. Okay. What, what you're actually What doing. we are actually doing. Yes, what you're doing, who your customers are. You know, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Question, another question, yes. Hi, yes, I'm Brett Warner with America's Future Foundation. Um, you all kind of touched on sort of hiring for character. Do you have any tips on how to do that or what to look for when you're actually looking to hire someone for that quality? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll give that a start. Uh, of course, references are critically important. Uh, don't hire somebody without having taken a, a good hard look at a number of references. But I've found over time that uh, 
your interview opportunities with a candidate for a job reveal a great deal about character. Find out, you know, did they, um, how did they handle tough situations in previous uh, employments? Uh, put scenarios in front of them and ask them how they would deal with them. Uh, and uh, uh, that will tell you typically things about, you know, how much of a premium they put on things like uh, honesty, keeping your word, uh, being fair uh, to colleagues. Uh, those are important ways to find out. But also, uh, take a look at their experiences outside of the workplace. Uh, historically, we have had good luck at uh, both at FEE and I think at Banco as well where we hire people who have uh, previously played competitive sports and done it well. And that's largely because that's, that's evidence that they can be a team player. If, if you explore that a little bit, see how, how well they did and how they uh, treated their colleagues. Um, but I think probably references uh, I rely on as much as anything. Yeah, that's also cool. Sure, I would say I tend to <coughs> Uh, rather than to hire for character, I just hire characters. And, uh, <laughs> but seriously, uh, one of the best things, and both at the Institute for Justice and now at the Goldwater Institute, um, obviously I had to hire <coughs> experienced lawyers early on. But my ultimate goal is to never hire an experienced lawyer, but rather to hire people who have interned for us. And basically, test driving your product is the best possible way, not only to measure character, but to, to measure quality as well. So um, uh, promoting from within, and then allowing, uh, basically trying to have as many entry level positions in your organization as possible, and hiring from, uh, from people who have interned for you. I think it, it is the very, very best way to, to ensure that you're going to get um, the type of character and quality that you want. For an organization like yours, um, I think what that means is to really encourage people, young people, students, to do internships. And um, this is the best way to get on radar screens. And then if, if Larry were to pick up the phone and call me and tell me that somebody was phenomenal, in fact, you know, we're trying to steal Richard, um, my mentee, away from, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wish list on fiscal. But, but uh, no, if, if Larry were to do that, someone who would work for him or intern for, for him and wanted to go into law, boy, would that, that be a, a huge uh, star in, in my pantheon, so. If I can elaborate a little, also what on, uh, what Larry said about the scenarios. That's what we do, definitely. We create scenarios where there's no wrong answer. And you just find out how people respond to situations. You can say it's a year-end situation. You have to go out with all your fundraising pitches. You have to write all the reports. You have to manage a lot of programs. Uh, you have staff issues. And then you create a little scenario and say, how do you respond to this? What do you attend to? And in this situation, what would they decide to do? And you find out a lot about it. Yeah, thanks. I have a, a, a Mark Edward from the Institute of Economic Affairs. I had a question on fundraising, particularly picking up Larry's point. I'd be interested in the views of all of the panel on this think big idea. Um, uh, I've been at the IA five years, and each year, broadly, uh, we've tried to increase our fundraising base by 15%. Which actually sounded to me modest until I realised it just means I don't understand compound math. But the the thing that I found the hardest to judge is with a, a, a new prospect, a new donor, what sort of level to aim at. You know, you can see whether this could be the Sunday Times rich list or whatever, you have an indication of whether they're worth five million or five hundred million. But I've never really known whether it's going big. Can I have a quarter of a million pounds, please? Or whether to just start to build the relationship with, with them modestly. But if I can get somebody from naught to 5,000, 
then going back to them when I've spent that £5,000 well and asking for 10 or 15 or 20 is that much easier. So my approach has been, perhaps thinking relatively big, now I understand compound mathematics, but generally with new people to get the foot in the door to begin that relationship. And even if I sort of could have asked for 25000 at the time, I might have got a yes. I've tried to ask for five and then maybe the next year 10 and 15. But I'd be interested in any guidance or ideas about how to approach that by now. I think it's best to go into those meetings prepared for uh, any number of scenarios within that range of just get them in the door to something big. A lot depends upon how it goes. If you discover in that meeting that uh, at some point the, the uh, donor prospect says things like, uh, wow, where have you been all my life? Uh, well, I love what you guys are doing. And you know that kind of enthusiasm, well, then you can start talking about things at the larger end of things. But if you find a tentativeness, a, a hesitancy, uh, you may want to drop a few hints about what people uh, in their occupations, their line of work, are giving as a range, but uh, invite them to come aboard and to build the relationship. There have been many times when I've said to people, look, you're just getting to know us, and in one hour, I can't tell you all that we're doing or make our, our case uh, as complete as I'd like it to be. We'd love to have your support and um, hope that over time we will merit your increased support. But we'd, we'd love to have you as a partner now, whatever level you feel appropriate. So a lot of it depends on the, the meeting itself and what kind of open door they give you. But not, there's no good substitute for having done research ahead of time. If you've got to develop a team that looks at things like Wealth Engine and other sources, uh, you should get some good idea. But also keep in mind that few people, I would err on the side of asking big most of the time because few people are offended when you've asked them for more than they can do. Uh, they're flattered that you thought they had it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. No, um, I, I just would 100% agree with Larry. Um, and I think, it, you know, so many times in fundraising, you know, everything comes down to the two words. It depends, you know, and it depends on the situation. Um, they talk always about trying to listen your way to the gift, you know. So you have to um, being prepared and asking questions that would indicate to you, give you some clues as to uh, how closely aligned this this prospect might be with your mission and how willing they they might be to commit. But um, I don't. I think that's 100% on, on on target in terms of. Um, having, if you want 250,000 pounds, have a 250,000 pound idea. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Caroline Rowell from the Institute of Economic Affairs. I work closely with Mark on fundraising. Um, one of the challenges that we come up with is that increasingly donors want to fund specific projects. Um, and that's all very well and good, and it's often fantastic, and we've we funded some fantastic programs. However, uh, the resource to uh, write the proposals and then uh, write all the feedback and keep people updated is quite onerous. And there comes a point as well where um, sometimes the feeling is, actually, if we had the unrestricted money, we know how we could use it. We still need to pay for the new role. Um, and I know this has been a trend that's been growing, and uh, my colleagues back in, back in London have witnessed this too. Has there, is there now a point, do you think, where we should make a more concerted effort and say back to donors, I know you want to do maybe this, but you've got to believe in our vision and what we're doing and, um, and, leave, and trust us. A bit like how you maybe, maybe they trust their stockbroker to invest their money, they wouldn't get too involved. I don't know, I'm just interested to know what your views and experiences on that. Well, well, one thing, I, I think with any project that I'm presenting to a donor, I think I would want to also make sure that I'm building in some, the, the, the cost for some of that overhead. Uh, that's part of the project. I mean, our, our, pretty much our single big ex expense in a, in a think tank is our, the people, because you know, our product is our ideas. So um, we have to make an effort to educate donors as well to that. Uh, there was a, a paper written about 
three or four years ago from uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review. It was called the Nonprofit Starvation Cycle. And what they said is, what so many non happens at nonprofits is what you describe. Uh, we sort of undercost our projects because a donor wants a, a particular project. The donor gives less and thinks you can do more with less. And then we keep going, the cycle goes around till we starve our, our organizations out. So I think we have a role in, in helping educate donors um, about this and certainly um, building in some of the costs. I don't know if you're going to totally convince someone, especially perhaps a newer donor, to say, hey, just give us the money, we'll make the decisions on how to spend it. Um, I think there's still this the growing interest in uh, funding certain projects or even directing them, but I think we have to work on that education piece and explain that and, and build that in and explain it as well. Hi, my name is Carl Meisenbach. I'm currently helping Students for Liberty raise some money. I'm new to the nonprofit space. I work for a guy named Mark Cuban uh, in the private space forever. And what we did when we went out there was we built a sales force, whether it was for the Dallas Mavericks, we tripled the sales force, and I certainly see the universities. Uh, I'm in Dallas, SMU, they just raised $800 million. Wow, they've got 130 people in their development staff. I come into the freedom space, the liberty space, and I see typically the executive director and if maybe one or two staff people. Is it a catch-22 that we can't build a sales staff to go out there and sell our ideas, sell what we're doing? because we're also trying to keep below the 10% of charity navigator issue? Or should we just go to some contributors and say, this is the deal we need? Because I look at, I believe Thieves looking for a major gifts officer, KO's looking for a major gifts officer, uh, AHS is looking for a major gifts officer. I just um, am stunned that we don't have a deeper, what I'll call sales staff in the, in the Liberty space. So if you just comment on that. Yep. I think we uh, too narrowly think of our sales staff as people who carry development in their title. Uh, but there may be others on the staff who could be trained as salespersons too. Our, our pattern for growth at Mackinac, and I think as we grow at Fee, we're going to see some of this come together as well, was, uh, yeah, we always had a development department, but as we added issue departments like labor policy, education policy, what have you, we looked for directors of those policy departments who not only knew their subject and could communicate it, but also could sell the subject to donors. So uh, we said, look, you're director of education policy. You have a collection of people who give to us because of your work. Don't assume that the development department is in charge of those folks. You've got to go back and make a case each year because that donor wants to know from the guy he's, he's funding uh, what's you know what are you doing and uh, what impact has it had? So over time we built uh, a development department. Department you might say that was not just the director of development, but it was the director of the science, environment, and technology department, the labor department, the education department. They all had their own collection of donors that they worked, and uh, so we distributed it that way. I think at, at Fee today, those of you who know Richard Lawrence. Uh, he could make a, he, we would put him in front of any potential owner, and he could make a case as director of programs for fees seminars, for instance. Wayne Olson, our executive director, we sent him all sorts of places to talk with donors uh, who would relate better to him than they would to me. Uh, and we separately have a development department as well. So. If I can uh, add to that, um Alex Chafwin wrote this uh, column in the Forbes magazine a couple of year or two back where he was very critical with some of the free market think tanks and said some of them just produce something and then act like a state-owned enterprise believing they have a wonderful product but others are in charge of actually marketing it. And so he was putting a strong point that we have to take care that we also invest in the marketing of our products. If the customer doesn't like it, it's not necessarily the customer is wrong, it could be the product is wrong. So, and I see now in all the business plans that are coming out that marketing becomes a stronger and stronger uh, focus. I liked it in the Shark Tank yesterday that there were questions quite specifically on the budget for marketing. 
And I think this is a really growing issue in the free market fintech scene. So everybody knows by now we have to invest heavily in marketing, development, sales, you know, all these things. It's at least, if you want, it can be half of the budget because producing something is just the beginning of the story to bring it out to the customer. And the only thing I would like to add is that there are really two different issues. It's, it's finding the staff and funding the staff. <laughs> So the finding part, it has been a challenge for many, many organizations. And, but I am seeing some very positive signs and groups, various groups, I mean Atlas among them, but others within the movement um, that are trying to teach people that about fundraising, about careers in fundraising. Charles Koch Institute is one, but many others as well, to give people a sense that this opportunity exists. Uh, the second part of the funding staff, um, I, I think there's an opportunity there in some organizations. I see that driven more by the board because it's easier, I think, for the people closest to the organization to understand that need than going out to other donors who are broadly tied to your mission but might be a little hesitant to say, okay, my gift is going to be used for fundraising staff. Hello, my name is Vaishali from Center for Civil Society India. I've had the good fortune of working with Bridget as my mentor in this ALU mentorship program. And I must say that every Tuesday, 6 o'clock, is the time of the week that I look forward to because that's just relax, relaxation time for me. My question is for all uh, mentors here. Um, what are some of the best practices uh, in your organization or in your experience to retain, if not 100%, that 70% of high-performing teams? team members. So uh, that's one question. And the other thing is, what are, what are the bad practices that we should avoid in the think tank space to ensure that we retain our high performance in the team? To go for the second part first, I think that uh, we have discussed it with Armando and Claudia. Uh, one of the things we, we should avoid is to be tempted to, um, for example, join a political party or some kind of organization which is uh, not necessarily as independent as a, as a think tank. Could be even a company or a, or a, or a great organization or a, well, I was going to say union, union, or something like that. Uh, so try, to, you know, uh, sometimes you, you, you are approached by some donors uh, or uh, political parties that like your ideas and they say, you know, can you train our people, can you come and talk to us, and, and you should do it and keep a relationship, but uh, be aware of not uh, um, actually be, be part of or be perceived as too close to uh, uh, one such organization. And uh, I think in terms of retaining talent, you know, at the end of the day, I tend to believe that uh, uh, if you um, if there's a good team and you are producing a good product, which my first remarks were about that the ultimate market test for me, anyhow, is on the fundraising front. I mean, whether you are, you have something that is attractive enough for people to support and put their money or their houses, mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that when you see staff um, conscious about the mission and the vision and, and be part of, of, of the team, especially on that front. Uh, that's the kind of people you want to, 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 to retain and provide the right incentives, which are, of course, uh, not only monetary, but also in terms of the possibility of these uh, staff and the members to uh, have the experience of talking to people and go out there and share uh, their views with others so that they are seen as an integral part of the organization itself. I would uh, also take the second part first because it, it's the darker um, advice that I, I will give um, in terms of keeping, maintaining high quality. Um, and this actually came up in our, our mentorship uh, situation, so I was happy to be able to provide this advice. It's very important to develop objective performance metrics and uh, to evaluate people and have a fair system for doing that. But perhaps the most painful lesson I've had to learn over the years 
is if there is an impossible situation, and this often, more often relates to personality than to performance even, um, don't let it persist. Um, if you if you have a, a, someone that's just not working out and you've tried remediation, then term, then do the termination as quickly as possible, because otherwise the, the person will be a, a real negative uh, part of your organization. And um, I hate firing people even more than I I, I hate fundraising. Um, so it's really tough for me to do. But every time I have failed to follow my own advice, I've, I've really, really regretted it. On the happier side, in terms of uh, retaining uh, people, I think two things are absolutely essential to that. One is um, to allow for personal growth, um, to give people as many opportunities as possible to not have rigid job um, uh, um, classifications and descriptions, but to allow people to really follow their talent as far as it will take them, whether that means position growth or just doing more and, and different exciting things. Um, that's, it's so important to allow your, your human capital to develop and very closely related to that. Make your organization an impossible act to follow. Make your organization a place where people can do things that they would never be able to do anywhere else in terms of tangible accomplishments. I remember when W was elected president, um, and both Chip and I, uh, Chip Miller and I, were getting these people coming up to us and saying, what position are you going to take in the Bush administration? And we just laughed and said, we're going to take no position, and we're going to sue these guys. And we're going to enjoy that a hell of a lot more than we would if we were working for them. So um, I, it didn't even occur to us. And, and that's, the, that's the kind of culture you want to promote. And I'm hoping, for example, we just elected a phenomenal governor in Arizona who is a Goldwater Institute donor and a, a fantastic guy. My goal is that no one leaves the Goldwater Institute to join him because they can be more effective if they remain uh, in the Goldwater Institute. Mm -hmm. Just one, a couple more just quick things. Um, one, I think to retain employees, it's important to share your vision with them. Uh, there's many times I work with groups and they, they have a strategic plan, but the, the staff within the organization really don't have a way to connect to it. So share that plan with them, allow them to create goals and measurements that connect to that strategic plan so they understand your vision. And then two other things maybe to avoid. One would uh, be don't hire in haste. <laughs> Regret at your leisure if you do. Uh, sometimes we're in a crunch. We need someone right away, we feel, and we skip those important steps that uh, we discussed earlier. And then finally, um, uh, try not to have surprises. Uh, there are times, of course, uh, employees don't work out for whatever reason. But the day you talk to them about that, or and, and perhaps leaving your organization, this should not come as a huge surprise to them. If you, if as a manager, you should have been preparing them with regular reviews and uh, performance measurements, so that that day does not come as a shock. Thanks, uh, Pam. Robin first, and then Linda, and then. Okay. <coughs> Uh, my name is Robin Zidola, I'm the executive director of Sunday Foundation in the park. Uh, I've, been a, uh, I've been a mentee, I'm very proud of the mentors there, sitting right in front of my But also, um, I mean, for, uh, this was one of the first opportunities I had to, to you know, get uh, official mentors overseas. Uh, and this, was, uh, this came to me with a surprise. I was something I really wanted to do. And here's the reason why I wanted to, I just wanted to elaborate quickly. Uh, in, in countries like ours, where we're the, we're the only think tank, for example. And, and this scenario, I think, is, is, is true for many countries outside, outside North America and Europe. When your head hits the ceiling, there is no way you can break it. And, and, and in my opinion, my experience has been, when you have a mentor who you can bang your head on to break it. So, so it's very wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arnold, for that. Uh, but, uh, but on the question side, I want to go on the bill. 
um, on a really easy question, especially on the donor question side, because we come from a very different um, environment where donors means aid. It's not nothing to do with private donations. But we're trying to make a case for private donations. And often, many a times, when we prepare to try to go uh, start our donor cultivation in the first place, uh, we start thinking about this on, on so what's the donor servicing we're going to do, or what's in it for the donor? So my question is, you know, so how, how do you prepare? I mean, how do you service a donor? Service a donor? What do you, what do you send to the donor? You know, how do you keep the donor interested? In, you know, and, and if the donor asks a question uh, as such, it was asked yesterday on the Star Shark Tank, saying, so what's in it for us? And what's the answer? So, thank you. Freedom champion was the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, you know, I think with our donors, we we have to be showing that they're. You know, we've talked. I've heard so many different at so many different panels about the need to show impact, and we have to have a way that we're communicating that, but also that they're part of your success. So, um, you know, there's lots of different ways in which we can communicate. It might be different from country to country, uh, but it, it could be a combination of phone calls, emails. Uh, short letters, etc. But we always have to keep in mind that our, our communications need to be focused on the donor. The perspective shouldn't be just, here's a list of activities that we did, but what we're really accomplishing. And I always, um, I learned a lot from the Heritage Foundation, and one thing that I thought was very common in their communications with their donors is they regularly in almost every communication from Heritage, they go back to their mission. They mention it, their mission or their vision, almost everything that they do. And working in the development office, you thought, how many ways can I talk about the same thing? But that repetition was so critical. So, um, and I think you know when you succeed, if you go in to talk about it to a donor, and that donor already has, almost tells you what your mission is, and, and they're accurate. So, but just a few thoughts. Uh, I don't know who first said this, but I think it's a it's a uh, gem of wisdom for fundraisers, and that is that fundraising is really to be successful. It has to be friend raising. So you've got to get to know your donors, find out what their interests are, uh, aside from what may bring them to support you, and look for opportunities during the course of the year to drop them a note, give them a call, uh, send them something that may or may not relate to your work, but does relate to their interests in some way. So that. What you want to do is to put a donor in the position of when it's time to renew, they feel as though they just can't fail to renew because they disappoint a friend if they did. Uh, and so just try to put yourself in that position so that they feel close to you. Thank you. Linda. Um, I've got a number of conflicts with um, organizations I'm with, but I just I want to ask you a question. I was speaking with Noor at the Arab Center yesterday and their fundraising, and they haven't been there very long, and they've very, been very successful in the 18 months. But without exception, everything they've managed to raise is people will pay the hotel bill for the, for the um, conference, whatever. They'll pay the flights, they'll pay whatever. But they will not pay anything so far that they found out um, to um, the organization for their overheads. So you can't sort of add it on. Um, and I, I can't imagine there's an answer, but you're also jolly good at this. I thought I might try. And I didn't think there's anyone from the Arab Center here to ask it, but they'd love to know your answers. Well, I think Anne touched on it uh, earlier when she talked about baking into your proposals funding that covers uh, what could be called overhead. <coughs> Uh, we used to, uh, at Bangalore, we have a, if we made a major request of someone to fund, let's say, a policy initiative, labor, education, whatever, we always had a line in the proposal uh, that we called administrative support. And we didn't just leave that hanging so they'd have to guess what that is or just assume it's bureaucracy. We put in parentheses peer review, uh, receptionist time, uh, development support. You know, we kind of spell it out a little bit. Those are the over, th those are overhead things, but they're baked into larger proposals. And as a rule, that was 20 to 25 percent of the total uh, proposal. 
But then you have other donors that uh, you can't go to for general operating support. That's always the best kind of money to get. <coughs> but they tend to be the truest of true believers. Niels. I'm Nikos Monagos from Atlas. I just want to share a perspective on the question about retaining uh, staff, what to do and what not to do. Uh, from my personal experience, uh, the best thing to do is to share the credit for everything that goes right to retain people. And the worst thing to do is to crucify people for making a mistake. Uh, I've never, uh, in my line of business, with a lot of us lost millions of dollars, never fired or criticized anybody for making a mistake unless they lied or tried to cover it up, which comes to the question of character. So we make a mistake, we discuss it, we try to fix it and not do it again. But if we try to cover it up or lie about it, whether you offended the major donor or missed the deadline or did anything like that, that's the worst you can, thing you can do for uh, uh, your colleagues and employees. And uh, that's something to avoid. For sure. Would you? A question that Michelle and I discussed on our last calls, and we pitched it to uh, Kevin Gentry and hope to have him share it and crowdsource it on the development exchange, but I'd love to get y'all's feedback. Um, in the balance, Michelle was talking about um, one of our calls about um, reporting to donors and the significant amount of time it takes to collect the information from the staff who are doing the work, and you want them to be doing the work, yet you need the information to report to donors or to produce a report uh, or a proposal. So the balance of development staff whose job it is to fundraise and then the um, substantive policy staff who have to give you the substance of what it is you're selling, um, what do you find are the best kind of systems to put in place? I know when we were in uh, development at Heritage, we would walk the building and talk to people about what they were doing. You would just sit down in the chair in front of them and ask them what they were doing. But that doesn't it's not a very systematic way to do that. So I wonder if each of you could share um, kind of how you go about in your organizations the most efficient way of getting those reports, whether it's weekly reports or what are the best ways to get the impact and the, the ideas for proposals that the development people use as the fodder uh, to communicate with the donors. Um, I would just say I've seen um, lots of different organizations do it fairly successfully if they create opportunities for that interaction. And you know, whether that's on a, a conference call if people are in different locations. But I think you can't go too long uh, without working to gather that information because the, the stories, you know, sometimes those great stories that are absolutely critical to fundraisers when they're talking to donors get a little bit lost as time goes by. Depending on the size of the organization, the organization is rather small, say between 10 and 15 people. Um, something we have done is when we uh, attract uh, a critical mass of people that we are aid, trying to persuade about supporting a particular idea, and or B, trying to pick their brains to get um, something going like, for example, an index that we develop at the Global Adaptation Institute. Um, we literally have all your staff there uh, uh, being an integral part of the conversations and the discussions at different levels. So those who are always thinking have to come and be able to make a presentation. So we have Danny Kaufman, for example, who used to be at the night, come and present. Uh, how to develop an index. So we have Mark Miles, who used to work at the Hentai Foundation, or Anna Ayras, had uh, to come uh, and, uh, during the time they were helping us and have a direct contact with those that we were, A, trying to get to support us, and B, picking their brains because they had some of the knowledge that we were looking for. So that, I would say, for the small size uh, uh, think tank. I think in the case of the uh, ones that are a little bit larger, case of El Salvador, Fusades, where we had, um, as I mentioned, uh, a group of Chilenians uh, helping us out, and you have maybe 
120, 150 people working in the institution. I think you end up doing some of what you just mentioned, which is you know, just walking around and, and, and getting input from them and using the information, uh, communicating that information to, 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 to the donors in this case, uh, because you, it's very hard to have an opportunity to put all of them in front of the key players that you, you want to. I think we will slowly have to wrap up. Um, one thing that I would like to stress is um, the use of the network here. Uh, I think basically everybody here can mentor somebody else on something that you have experienced. I mean, the, the motto here that we have is best practices, new ideas, effective strategies, and, and that's a little more difficult, common mistakes. Um, but uh, I do believe, uh, you know, when it comes to Bashari's question, for example, we want to have good human resource policies, we want to retain good staff, we want to make sure they don't leave. How do we do that? Well, any company is struggling with the same issue. You need your clear target agreement process, you need people who have the feeling they can develop in your organization, you need to give them the feeling they can grow. They, they have a future and every company has to deal with the same issue. So every think tank will have to invent a target agreement process. Those of you who have a good one uh, can share it with the others or those who don't have it can address the others or just atlas and ask, do you know where one is available? How do you link that to the assessment? How do you assess staff so that it's objective and fair and how do you communicate it? All that is available. There are lots of initiatives in the movement who have it. And those who need it should just use this network. These kind of network op networking opportunities are the best ones to use. And everybody can become a mentor if you have some good practice on the fundraising, on the uh, human resource management side, and all the other ones, project management, and communication, marketing, etc. That's why we're sitting here, I guess. So let us thank the panelists for sharing this.